Hey guys, Tim here with a quick programming note. So as we were going to record this week, uh, Brian was feeling a little under the weather. So we decided to postpone the recording for a week. And uh, in its place, we're going to give you a dip back into the archives of an older episode. And this one's kind of in honor of the uh, recent announcement that Tubi is doing a remake of Terror Train, which is a favorite of mine. Uh, that's going to be coming out this Halloween on Tubi. So we decided we'd bring back our old episode where we covered Terror Train. Uh, and we hope you enjoy it. We will be back next week with a brand new episode. And we're going to be covering a uh, 1990s slasher that I think has become a bit of a cult classic. So see if you can guess what that's going to be. See you guys next week. <laughs> Hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode 42 of the Civil Gore podcast. 42, the answer to the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. <laughs> yes, and if you add four and two together, you get six, which means nothing. So, <laughs> but yeah, as you see, that, with, with that start of the, with that joke, that you're going to see the caliber of show you're getting tonight. Yeah. Apparently. <laughs> they can't all be winners. No, folks. they can't. <laughs> No, we do have a really good episode this week I'm excited about because I really love this movie. That is, of course, Terror Train from 1980, starring Miss Jamie Lee Curtis. And we also have a pretty decent disc membermint this week as well. Have some uh, pretty solid releases on there, some that I'm interested in. Yeah, no, and there's, yeah, there's definitely... Um, actually, uh, you know, looking... Not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but actually the next couple of months is a lot of good stuff, disc membermint-wise. So we're, we're in for some treats. I peeked ahead to next week, and I was like, wow, there's some really, really cool stuff coming down the pipe. So I uh, hope you have some of that Christmas money saved over. Your wallet's going to take a beating the first half of this year. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, not, they're not being uh, really fr friendly wallet-wise, I'll tell you that. Okay, well, let's get right into it with our first chop. So, Brian, of course, the Backlog Project is alive and well, and I have been hitting it hard. And the reason I've been hitting it hard is because of what we just talked about. There's so many good releases coming down the pipe. I don't want to go buying all this stuff until I'm finished because I'm not adding to my backlog. I'm trying to finish it. That was one of my resolutions. So uh, I have been really, really almost machine-like in my intensity, I would have to say. Yeah, and just looking ahead, I'll let you say it, but it looked like your, your wheel spun the lucky... Uh... Lucky selection that you've been waiting for. Yeah, yeah, this is a good, very, very good week. And the and the way I do it, uh, I, I don't actually list everything I've done with my backlog project because I have each disc divided into film, commentary, and extras. And when the roulette wheel stops, it does. I do the movie first, and then I spin a new movie. And if I've already seen the movie, then I go to the commentary. And if I've already done the movie and the commentary, I go to the the features. So. At any given time, whatever the wheel lands on, I'm doing one of those three items. Oh, and by the way, Tim is looking for an intern to manage the <laughs> yeah this thing. <laughs> it gets very complicated. Yeah. But uh, this, this week was a good, good selection. The first one up was Child's Play 2, which I had really not seen in forever. But it's a pretty solid sequel. It's, it's pretty good. Uh, the kid in it's... Uh, pretty decent uh for a ch for a child actor i guess you would say i mean he's not great but he's you know he adds a lot to the movie because he's curiously not that afraid of chucky as i would expect mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's kind of funny to watch him but uh but chucky's fantastic in this one you can really tell his personality you know they, they just went all the way with it so i really enjoyed that one well they had to step it up for the sequel you know yeah 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 but you i mean it was Interesting to me going that far back, because again, I haven't seen that sequel in so long, that uh, Chucky's personality and everything was so well-crafted that early in the franchise. Even in the first movie, to an extent. Yeah, I can, and I can't wait to go do that. I'm, I'm probably going to save it, because I know we're going to... Uh, he's he might, I, I, I assume he's probably the number one uh, big spoiler alert here. We've only talked about it 50 times. I think they'll probably he'll be the first topic for uh, the, this year's Summer's Vacation, so I'm kind of saving it for that. To, to watch that whole box set, so I'm I'm, kind of, I'm really excited for it. To, to me, like Bride of Chucky, and those are kind of more fall more comedy than horror in a way. But they've never Chucky's remained a constant throughout. Like his brutality and stuff has kind of remained the same from movie to movie, even as the the rest of the movie around it kind of shifted. 
back and forth. Then, of course, in the last two films, they got a little bit more to the horror side of it. So, yeah. well, he he may have gone to the comedy side, but but obviously he didn't. He was uh, still having trouble at those open mic nights because I don't think he ever made it to the. Uh, no. <laughs> He, he never made it to the comedy. Yeah, he never that might be a, a sequel sketch at some point. Yeah, maybe he finally makes it in this year. We'll have to see. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next one I had a... Well, oh, man, I was so excited for this. So <laughs> excited. That was the first movie in the Paul Nashi collection that I got for Christmas. And it's called Horror Rises from the Tomb. Now, I don't know who Paul Nashi is. I had no clue going into this box set who he really was. And if that makes me a bad horror fan, so what? I mean, it's 70s Spanish horror. I can't know everything. I th- he's just that bearded guy that's on the cover, right? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of obscure little uh, niche. But, man, I loved, loved, loved this movie. It was fantastic. It reminded me of a Hammer film, first off. It's very Hammer-esque. I'm talking about the, you know, the, the crazy, over-dramatic organ music and the... You know, the location shots and the gothicness of the whole thing, it, it re- totally reminds you of a Hammer production. It kind of looks just like the box art even reminds me of it. It looks like, yeah, you know, like that, like that was... pseudo comic book look or something. Yeah, yeah. The The story was really entertaining, I thought. I mean, it was very well-paced movie. I was never bored. It's about uh, some people go to this uh, this mansion i guess you would call it and there's this uh without looking i'm not looking at names i'm not pulling up on amdb right now so i'm kind of going by memory but there was this old uh back in the witch trial days or whatever there was this, this evil guy that was hanged and his wife or his mistress or lover or whatever she was executed and he vowed he would come back and so he's kind of like a kind of a vampire in a sense hmm. he's like an undead guy but he he basically comes comes back or they unearth him and you know he he he's actually played by paul nashi who is like kind of resembles like a guy that works at your comic book store yeah. he's kind of this it's so weird he's but he's very charismatic all the three b's are there mm. some more than others the, you know the top the topic kind of sound like those those vault of horror and tales from the crypt comics the way you were saying it with the, the, the revenge element and I, it very much is. It's very much like one of those segments extended to a feature film. Oh, nice! But well, you can't man, go wrong with I, that. I mean, you can't go wrong with that formula. It's always, it's always a, a yeah, a well done. So, like super beautiful women and crazy gore effects. It's just, everything you could love about those old seventies films is in this. And I hope the rest of the collection is as good as this one because I really, really loved this movie. Uh, so you have, definitely have to check that one out, Brian. And I would say it's definitely worth picking up the box. Yeah, no, I, ha- I still have them on my – I had them on my wish list. I mean, granted, if they're still there, my birthday's in May. I'll, I'll you know, make sure they're, they're to the forefront up there. But if yeah. not, I may, I may end up getting them. But then, Because, I mean, I buy enough stuff on Amazon. I'm always getting Amazon points and – yeah, and you know, so it's like you know, if I keep go, if I go, I mean, was it like I think it's like forty something dollars? You know, yeah, it's like forty bucks. They could have yeah. sales. You never know. So I'll keep an eye up, open for sales on it and and whatnot. And I still get a discount from the the from my move. I remember I was telling you I keep getting this discount. I forgot it's because with a change of address came with some kind of promotion. So I get like like all these. I get like I think it's like ten, uh, not ten percent. I think it's a few, I, some amount I get off of all my Amazon orders um, lately. So I don't know how long this goes, but I think it's probably going to end very shortly. But so I don't know. I'll get get it while I can. I guess. And then the old roulette wheel said, you know what? It's time for some classic universal horror. So it spun three in a row. Wow, yeah. And the, totally <laughs> the, the first one up was The Mummy from, uh, oh gosh, the 30s, whatever. <laughs> uh, the enough. original Mummy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this one, man, this one, <laughs> this one's such a slow paced film. Oh my gosh. I've seen it many times before, but it's such a slow paced movie. Even for a universal movie, it's pretty slow paced. And it's only like an hour and change that, it's not even a, a 90 minute movie oh my god and it's still it still feels interminable um i mean great film obviously it's a classic but to me the mummy will always be my least favorite of the universal classic monsters i'm sorry he's i, I don't find him scary i don't find it even all that interesting <laughs> to be honest. the next one up was two from the frankenstein set the first one up was frankenstein meets the wolfman and this one was obviously a cash in on the, uh, you know, by this point, the Universal films were, you know, big hits, especially among the younger crowds. 
who came to see the monsters fighting and that kind of stuff. So you have a kind of a contrived plot to get Frankenstein and the Wolfman in the same location. And of course, Lon Chaney Jr. reprises his Wolfman role, which was great. And uh, Bela Lugosi, <laughs> uh, it plays Frankenstein, which was cool. And it's sad that they could, they don't think they're going to be able to get this back like they wanted to. The resurgence of this whole universe with the mummy. Yeah, because I mean, how cool would that yeah. be? But, you know, yeah. too bad. Uh, this one, you know, it, it's okay. It's all the Universal classics are have their charm in some way or the other. I wouldn't call this one one of the best of the yeah. franchise by any means uh, due to the kind of contrived plot. The uh, The next one I found a little more entertaining, and that is because it you get to see Lon Chaney Jr. and Boris Karloff on screen together. Oh, wow. Which I thought was kind of neat. Uh, Boris Karloff plays not Frankenstein in House of Frankenstein, which is the movie I'm talking about. He actually plays the mad scientist, and he does a great mad scientist. Ah, cool. And uh, Lon Chaney Jr. reprises his Wolfman role. It does have some loose uh, continuity with the uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman film, so they were trying to keep the story somewhat uh, connected, which is kind of cool. And this will be followed by House of Dracula, which is in apparently every Universal set. <laughs> <laughs> that too, along with the the Abbott Costello, apparently, right? Yeah, because uh, House of Dracula is even in my Frankenstein set, I believe. So that's weird. I don't know how that. that you know, I, don't I mean, know how that works. I, it's you know, it's it's. I guess it's they wanted to make sure you got value, but you know, I would have much rather have knock a couple of bucks off and stop putting the same movie in every. <laughs> you know, it's like. Well, plus you would think they would want to uh, maximize their sales by keeping certain films exclusive to certain sets, right? So you buy all of them. So I, I don't. Uh, it's kind of a weird. Uh, I mean, I can understand from a monster standpoint. You know, this has Dracula; it needs to be in the Dracula set, right. and it also has Frankenstein, so it needs to be in the Frankenstein set. Okay, I right. can kind of see that, but I think they missed some uh, business opportunity there. Yeah, or they could have done like the crossover set. You know, like with the yeah something. But and finally, the last one I watched, which uh, just wrapped up today, was Phantasm Three: Lord of the Dead. Not not to be confused with Phantasm Three: Lord of the Dance, which was yeah. uh, <laughs> done separately. <laughs> What was that called? What was that? Oh, God. That was a big thing back then. Like the Irish dancing It was thing. Lord of the Dance, remember? It was like Lord of the Dance. It was Lord of the Dance. Yeah, it was Lord of the Dance. Yeah, that was <laughs> Yeah, but that was everywhere for about, what, five minutes? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, you got all the theme parks even had a Lord of the Dance like routine, it seemed like. Yeah, and I just remember the funny, the one, uh, I, a little off topic, but remember that, you know, seeing that movie, 10 Things I Hate About You. Yeah, yeah. And my favorite, one of my favorite lines in that is David Krumholtz. You know, uh, he's, you've seen a million things. He was uh, Wednesday Adams' boyfriend in the Adams Family movie, and the second one I guess. And he just walks up and he's trying to impress the girl at the party, and he walks up and he goes, "Lord of the Dance," and he just <laughs> like a, <laughs> like this weird dance maneuver, and she walks away. Oh god. So yeah, so that's uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to include that. Yeah. You guys all have to suffer. I mean, now I can't get the image out of my mind of the tall man just doing up there. Oh, Lord of the Dance, yeah. High step. Well, that's another Kickstarter starter, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh, man. As much as I enjoyed Phantasm 2, I think Phantasm 3 is even better. In fact, I went and looked at a ranking of the Phantasm films, and more than one site had Phantasm 2 as the worst of the franchise. Really? And I was like, if that's the worst... And I loved it so much. Like, this this has to be a super solid franchise. Phantasm 3 is basically another road trip movie. You got Reggie going out, fighting the tall man. They brought back the original Mike, which was cool. Mm. Now he's grown up, obviously, when this was made. And they introduced these super, super cool characters. You have this uh, African-American lady. I think her name's Rocky or something like that. And she's, uh, she's like a, just a badass fighter. You've got this kid who's like a badass, like a little kid. Hmm. And uh, it, the, the characters are just super interesting. I have not, I don't know that I ever saw this one. This one may have been one I missed because I did not remember anything about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I'm very sketchy on what I've seen out of the Phantasm series. It's one of those series, you know, you, you sometimes don't remember what you see out of it. <laughs> yeah, I remember like scenes from certain ones, but maybe I didn't watch the whole thing or yeah. I don't know what happened. But man, this, <laughs> this one's fantastic. It's got a good sense of humor. It's it's just another, you know what I was thinking about when I was going to talk about this. The thing I love about the Phantasm series is I always love when a creator, like a director or a writer or whatever, basically puts out this kind of batshit crazy idea and they just say, this is how it's going to be. You can either get on the train or get off the train. Like, you know, they don't make any concessions to 
uh, tropes or, or what's mainstream or they just put out their vision and that's it. And that's kind of how phantasm is. Yeah. And I have to say on a, on a side note, excellent. You, whether you did it intentionally or not, excellent uh, way to stay in the theme of tonight's episode with train and concession. And, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. See, Tim, Tim is like so good at podcasting now. He just it's all subconsciously oh can, can <laughs> just wield these words to be perfect in his description. <laughs> How did you notice that? Well, anyway, that was totally intentional, by the way. Of course it was, Um, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so, because the movie makes no sense. You have this tall man running around that's kind of an alien guy, and he can make zombies, and there's floating balls floating around that kill people, and they... Nothing about this franchise makes any sense whatsoever, and somehow it works, and I loved it. Phantasm 3, awesome. Cannot wait to see Phantasm 4, which was ranked even higher. Wow. So yeah, we'll see. Now I don't know how Ravager did because the articles I read were pre-Ravager. Mm. A lot of these came out right before that came out. So I'll we'll see how that one falls into the pantheon. But I can't wait to cover this one on, on a future summer slaycation because it's a great series. And I was gonna now I was gonna wait till that, but now I have to jump into this early because you got me all like wanting to see it. So yeah, hi- highly recommended. Yep. All right, all you Brian, what you got? Yeah. So I didn't come even close to as much as. Uh, uh, Tim did. Go, yeah. <laughs> well, in the many ways. Um, <laughs> <coughs> sorry, now I'm choking, cracking me up. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I only ended up watching a couple things. Um, one was just because it was on cable, and I always, always like watch. I mean, I like anything with, with sharks in it and stuff, and so Open Water was on. And it kind of reminded me of, uh, of the, you know, it, it definitely fit into this certain, you know, a lot of people like... Uh, you know, like they like certain types of horror, and this one I I kind of dubbed it myself like those real life real life forgotten uh films, which is I call it, where it's like, you know, someone like is doing just a normal thing and they're forgot, they're they're left behind, or they're, you know, like that movie Frozen that Adam Green did, uh, not to be confused with the Disney version, because you could really get a, a shock if you grab the wrong title off the shelf. Um, <laughs> But, you know, where and that was the one, of course, where they got left on a ski lift. And it's like you wonder and you're just like, oh, God, why didn't these people, you know, just do this or I can't believe this. But, you know, you watch this. And to me, those are sometimes the more terrifying types of horror films because they are you could see how that could actually happen. And now, of course, that was loosely based on an actual story, which I did while I was watching it. Actually, Julie and I were like looking up the, the real story to see how close it was. And it was, you know, other than the basic element of it, it was, uh, you know, there was a lot of different things that, like, went into the true story. And, um, you know, obviously they had to play it cinematically to make it more appealing. So, you know, it was a little more dramatic at different scenes. And apparently in the real story, they weren't even – no one realized they were gone for two days. Even – it wasn't so Mm. much that – and it was funny. In the the movie, it seems like they discover it as they get back, like, the next morning – but here it's like I guess it wasn't until they were out on their like uh, second charter since the original couple got lost, uh, and they start they found their diving weights I guess at the bottom, and they thought they would just got lucky that some other tour group left it there. So oh man, yeah, it was really interesting, and there was a lot more into the story that I didn't realize. Where at one point they thought it was a murder suicide, at one point they thought it was. Uh, they faked their own death, the couple. So, I mean, it got really crazy, which obviously would not play out right for the type of movie they were trying to go for. And so I'm kind of glad they just did it the way they did because it still made it for a really like, if really just entertaining and, and kind of frightening movie because it's funny. Julie was telling me, she goes, yeah, she goes, after about a half hour, I'd realize we, we'd be dead already, but I wouldn't tell you that. <laughs> She knows that <laughs> she would be telling me that we'd be okay still, and I'd be like, "See, I don't believe that. I, I think Julie would do some kind of MacGyver move." And, well, that's what I said. I, she would create some kind of contraption and have some brilliant plan to get you out of there. Well, that's what I said. I said, "You, I said, you'd be smart enough by the by by twenty minutes in to figure it out. All right, we got to start swimming one way or the other." You know, and it was funny since I saw that movie. Um, we had done, you know, I've done. Uh, I did one very basic snorkeling. Uh, type of thing once and then there was another time where julie and i actually on our hawaii trip we went uh snorkeling in the malakini crater and it was funny it was like i was sitting there and i was like wow you know what 
Imagine this was like open water, but I'm realizing like I'm calming myself down because I'm like, okay, a worst case scenario, literally there's a giant island slash crater. There's land I could see and walk <laughs> up out on. So that kind of calmed me down. However, I did uh, – I always did say if I ever do go true skiing, like we went uh, snowboarding last year, and I said by the time – as soon as that thing starts to – even the sun starts to remotely set, we're leaving. Because <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to get trapped Yeah, on I am not going to get trapped on uh, some kind of ski lift with wolves. But um, <laughs> yeah, so those type of movies, I want I, – I wish they'd make more of those because those are things that truly have like a, a – like a, like a you know an impact on me in terms of terror. and it's like it, and it's funny because as soon as I watch these things I'm already like planning like okay if I'm ever gonna do this kind of uh this kind of activity I'm making sure I bring my making sure I have a yeah. cell phone I tell everybody where I am if I don't check in by this time so yeah so it's but it's kind of it, those kind of movies I, I like a lot I wish there was, I wish there was a lot more of them and I'm sure I'm missing some that are out there right now so, so. You, you wish more people would die in horrible stranded accident so that they could make cool movies just send, yes just send them mathematically though they could come up with it you know you could be original like <laughs> i don't think people actually i don't think adam's green was based on something real <laughs> oh not <laughs> but um oh gosh there was actually another one i don't it's definitely not a true story either i but it's just a it kind of reminds me of a little bit it's called altitude you ever see that where these this group of friends are trapped in a plane and it just keeps accelerating like uh like ex- ascending oh, no. upwards yeah it's it, it's kind of it has a little weird twist to it in the end, but it's uh it's a one that you should check out. It's pretty good too. Yeah, so that was that was what I watched, and then um, I guess our well, I did watch something else. I was gonna put this after, but I might as well go into this now. Um, that Friday the Thirteenth Part Three uh, mini doc was released uh, Saturday night, um, on the Friday the Thirteenth Network. Well, we'll post a link uh, to this because it's a great uh, YouTube channel where they have a I guess they have a monthly show and they do a thirteen on thirteen. Where they go uh-huh. through all different things of Friday the Thirteenth, the franchise, the video games, you know, collectibles. Now, I did have a question. I had yes. a question about this one. So you've seen the doc, I assume. Yes. And you've seen the Crystal Lake Memories yes. documentary. So is there anything that this doc adds to the part three that the Crystal Lake Memories did not have? Well, yeah. Uh, well, it's very it's Richard Brooker centric because it's in a, it's a memoriam doc. So okay. It really focuses on – I mean it goes through first like a little bit of – it has a little bit of everything. It's really short. It's like 36 minutes and well, the main thing they do – but they try and like very – you know, make it like kind of as a uh, – like a memoriam to him. So there's a lot of stuff they talk about him. They go through um, a couple of basic stuff about how they – you know, how they went to film it in, in uh, you know, 3D and all the different things. They go to, the you know, the – Little 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 factoids of how people try to uh, you know like always go visit and it's and sneak into the actual filming location and stuff and but yeah like the main point of this documentary was uh, you know basically to to honor Richard Brooker who who died and um, of course he was played Jason and it was just kind of funny to see all the people tell stories about you know little stories about him and stuff so I definitely I don't want to go into too much because you know so take anything away otherwise you know. So, but it's it's really short. I think it's like I, I literally think it's like thirty seven minutes. It's good. It's actually hosted by Paul Kratka, which played uh, um, Paul, I guess. Right? Was, was it Paul? Or, no. What? Well, the guy that's eyeball gets shot out. What's I forgot his real name. I know it's Paul Kratka. Eyeball guy. Yeah, eyeball <laughs> guy. I know his real name is Paul Kratka, but I can't remember his. Uh, I, I I don't remember his character name. It could be Paul also, but but yeah. So uh, he's. He actually narrates it, so it's you know, and there's a lot of like clips of uh, other uh, Friday the Thirteenth people recognize, like Shelley makes an appearance, you know, or Larry Zerner, of course. Um, so it's yeah, you get a little little bits of interviews. It's definitely not to the uh, you know the the true documentary like uh, way that um, the Crystal Lake Memories, which which by far I cannot remember. That's got to be one of the best documentaries ever made. On a on a I film, s- I series. still haven't sat down to watch. Yeah, that. and I mean, I, I've seen it twice, all like eight plus hours twice. I mean, I haven't watched it in one sitting, obviously, because but you know, you, you break it up and it's great. And you know, they break the the document is broken up by movies anyway, so it's really easy to just watch like a couple a night mm. if you want. But yeah, no, but definitely recommend this, and definitely recommend this YouTube page because it's fantastic. the The guy does a great job on this, and we'll definitely have to, have to, just want to give him a shout out and um. So we'll post the link on that. So yeah, and it's free. So it's great. How you get? I mean, a thirty-seven minute documentary on Friday the Thirteenth, and for for free. How you argue with that? No, it can't be argued. Well, nope. speaking of Friday the Thirteenth, so our Ghostradamus predictions, which we did last week, 
all of a sudden, all of them started coming true because yeah. we're that awesome. <laughs> now, it is worth yeah. pointing out, Brian, that we did not make these predictions last week. These no. predictions we made were made back before Christmas because we had originally planned to do those like way back before the holidays, and we ended up pushing that episode out. Right. So what you were hearing, our predictions, even though we recorded it after the holidays, those predictions themselves were written down and were in in print long before all this news broke. So yeah, and I, in fact, remember we did record it actually, and then, but that was when you got you got the emergency call from work. We had to actually redo some of that episode. Oh yeah, that was the so we actually lost have episode. Yeah, yeah, so we actually have proof. We actually have it the original recording. Have audio if nobody proof believes this. Yes, with timestamps. Yes, but anyway. So, so yeah, we had a bunch of bunch of news hit. Now, obviously, the the I guess the more shaky of the of the news was the speculation that the Friday the Thirteenth uh, reboot or sequel or whatever might be coming out by Blumhouse and might be announced soon because Blumhouse had talked about wanting to resurrect the franchise and then they had also mentioned that they were. Uh, locking in a Friday the 13th release date for one of their films, which they did not specify. So the idea was put two and two together. Maybe there's this actual Friday the 13th film in the works that's going to come out. Now, since then, there has been some back and forth, and a lot of people say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Friday the 13th is a a normal horror release date anyway. Yeah. Let's don't jump the gun. We still have legal issues. Oh, my God. Yeah, you got to read that. It gives you a headache to try and figure out those who owns what. Yeah, the legal issues for that franchise are just crazy right now. So uh, that one, I would say, is the the one to take with the most grain of salt. Right. But uh, yeah, and I mean, it was, and th- uh, shout out to Paul too, who sent me that article uh, because he gave he was the one that sent me that one about the Friday the Thirteenth release date, and it was it was great because I I had I had seen the first part of that about how Blumhouse the guy was uh, Jason uh, with Jason right was yeah close? Jason yeah he quoted by saying oh I'd love to do a Friday the Thirteenth so. You know, you know how the internet is. They pick up things and put them all but together. We're still, we're, we're still saying it's going to be released. Yes. My prediction, well, technically, if you go further into that article, it does say that uh, supposedly the decision uh, to see if Victor Miller owns the, the rights to it uh, is supposed to be done some point in the summer. So my summer prediction, I did say by the summer. So yeah. the summer could is basically ends what? September 21st is the official end of summer. So That's ha- right. So yeah, I have still September 21st, yes, to, to be proven <laughs> wrong or right. <laughs> <laughs> you got plenty of time. Yeah. And then uh, one of my predictions was that we would see a resurgence of horror anthologies. Yep. And Hulu has ordered a new horror anthology. There you go. There you go. Boom. That yeah. easy. <laughs> Boom. That easy. That's how it is. We hit yeah. the easy button. And then uh, Brian let me know about this one. We had talked about, um, I can't remember if it was you or me, Brian, had talked about a horror franchise coming to TV. I think it was a little both of us. We kind of, like I had said, yeah. like an 80s thing, and then you said about a TV. Yeah, so we, we kind of both had variations on this, to, 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 and if obviously you put the power of Tim and I together and you get the exact yeah. prediction, correct? Yeah, we, we create our own reality, and that is a <laughs> Critters TV series, Yep. which Bri- Brian had on the brain because he got me a Critters for Christmas, so... He yeah, knew see, this was coming. See, so go look at that. That, that, that was like that, like cemented it. That was kind of like my my secret prediction to, to kind of give you a hint to what was coming. <laughs> and then, I, just as an aside, I saw there was a new Hellraiser coming out on video. Yeah, like video. another one. So that, yeah, there's so. another franchise. Now, granted, that one's a little okay. That's kind of stretching a little bit because they never really went away. <laughs> they never went away. They've been coming out almost semi regularly direct yeah. to video. So, but man, whenever we do that franchise, that's gonna that's. Gonna, you're going to have to give us some prep time for that one. Jeez. Wow. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know. How many movies now? Ten? At yeah. least ten. And you know, I already started to early prep on to see how I'm going to obtain these because obviously, yeah, I don't want to watch them now if I see them because then I'll have to rewatch them as it gets closer to whenever we do this. So I'm looking. I'm like, I see a lot of one, two, and three box sets available, but I have not. I don't think there's a definitive collection. We can get all of them yet. Well, at one time, Netflix had all of them, just about. Right, right. That's what I'm hoping they'll come back with that, or maybe Shutter yeah. will, or something. Or, <laughs> oops, sorry, there's a hiccup there. See, that's that's a good beer right there for you. <laughs> Leaf pile ale by a uh, Greenport uh, pumpkin ale. See, I'm still stretching this pumpkin thing. But uh, <laughs> well, I've got two. Uh, I've got actually got a Mad Elf Christmas ale. That oh, I'm those are fantastic! Oh, I love that Mad Elf. 
That's a great so brewery, Trogues. I'm like, you remind me, I need to open that up right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so po- apology for my hiccup. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, so the the, the Hellraiser series, that, I, I, that's going to be a doozy to try and, and get a hold of everything. Virgin had a, had a complete set of this. So, yeah, I'm not sure how we're going to handle this yeah, one. <laughs> um, see, I had not opened my beer to this point because my wife had promised me there was going to be coffee. Oh, yeah. And now I feel like Mariah Carey <laughs> on New Year's Eve. I was I was told there would be coffee, but I guess I'm just going to have to drink beer with you peasant people. You oh, my God. That, I know. Look at you. I'm becoming so a diva. You get one prediction right, and then now, you, now you're, you're demanding things be brought to you. <laughs> mm, I was told there would be coffee. Well, That's a good trade. This beer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so that was our first chop. Uh, yeah, so yes, we did awesome. Yes. Pat ourselves on the good back. Good job, Tim. Good job, Brian. All right, let's get right into our disc memberment. Wait, no, please, God, no, don't cut off my. <laughs> that disc memberment sound effect is so long that I have to leave. Have to leave a. Got to leave. Got to give it some. Give it some room to breathe. Yeah, but it's a great, great sound effect. Great sound. I love it. I love it. I don't want to chop it. I don't want to. No, shorten we can. It's so good. Yeah. Oh. So the uh, first one up. These are the Blu-ray releases for January twenty third, twenty eighteen, and the first one up is an is a Dario Argento title, uh, opera from nineteen eighty seven. Now this one's interesting in that this was one of the first. Maybe the first Italian horror film I ever watched, because I remember this one I first watched when I was just getting into DVD. This would be '98, I believe. Was the DVD players really '97, '98? And they really started coming um, on the market. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, just about. And so that's when I had bought my rudimentary home theater system on my scraped together college budget, you know, <laughs> scraping every nickel and dime to put this thing together. And, and opera was one of those titles that I believe I rented. I don't think I bought it. I don't think I've ever owned it. But uh, I, re- I remember that was when I was really, really getting into horror movies uh, big time in my college, my my what I call my college horror years. <laughs> So, um, but this one, I don't remember much about it. Honestly, I haven't seen it in a long time, uh, but it is considered a classic. So I'm probably going to pick it up at some point. That's funny that we both, I mean, I, mean, I guess it's not so surprising that like, like DVD, horror DVDs were close. Cause actually one of my first, I bought four DVDs that when I first got my DVD player and one of the first ones was, uh, Psycho. So it was kind uh, of yep, exciting to have that on mm-hmm. uh, DVD. <laughs> well, like, do you know what my first DVD was? Which one? As good as it gets. Wow. With Helen Hunt and Jack Nicholson. Interesting. I think my I can you know what's funny? I'm actually forgetting the first the other ones next to I like I remember Psycho was definitely one and Can't Hardly Wait, I think, was one of them, and I can't remember the other two right now. See, we're ruining your we're ruining everybody's ideas of us. Our first DVDs were rom coms. Yeah, I mean go yeah. Well, you know But man, as good as it gets. Wow, what a great movie. Yeah, How that's a great movie. movie, yeah. It's a fantastic movie. Okay. And when you get excited um, when you have a new format like a DVD. I, remember I was like just uh, – it was the fact that you could buy a high quality – because remember, laser discs uh, were expensive when you would yeah, buy them. Yeah, I never them. had a laser disc. DVDs like, were ridiculously cheap in comparison when – in terms of getting a brand new movie. You know, and remember they were coming out – um, price to sale when videos at the time. Remember, they were coming. They first would come out for rental only for a while, and it wasn't mm-hmm, every, eighty it, bucks. Yeah, yeah, every movie was not purchasable for you know in terms of a, a normal budget. So, I, and so it was kind of interesting when DVDs came out. It was great. Like every movie that was released, pretty much you could just walk in there and pick it up, and it's like you know cost you like anywhere from fifteen to twenty five bucks at the time. I mean, obviously they got some got more expensive, but most of the time they were between fifteen to twenty five was the average. Yeah, well, true story. I bought as good as it gets and Twister before I ever owned a DVD player. Oh, really? Just, just to have? So, just to have, because uh, I knew I would have one at some point, and I saw them in Circuit City, and I was like, oh, it'd be just so cool to own this movie. I, I guess I had a Helen Hunt thing at the time. Ah, hey, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Oh, it. that's true. That must have been the real. Now we get to the bottom of it. <laughs> There Tim's some, laying on the couch conscious... <laughs> in, in the, uh, the the psycho- psychologist's office. Oh, yes. So, uh, what were your first two DVDs? I think you have a Helen Hunt that. association. <laughs> yeah. 
I just realized that. Thanks for the psychoanalysis. I don't know what that means. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> so back to uh, opera. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it stars. Uh, let, let me see how many of these Italian ga- names I can murder. Uh, Christina Marsalac, yeah, Ian looks... Charlson, and I like this guy's yeah. name, Urbano Barberini. Yeah. Is, hey. I know, isn't that the guy from? Well, isn't that what John Travolta played on Welcome Back? <laughs> I was like, is that Welcome Back? Connor? Oh my gosh. Okay, so the synopsis is. A young operata, which I love that. That's a cool word. I've never heard that. Yeah, operata. operata. A young operata is stalked by a deranged fan bent on killing the people associated with her to claim her for himself. Very basic plot. Simple. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A 2K remaster with color correction. They did point that out. There's a lot of color correction. That's kind of cool. A new interview and a new 5.1 audio mix. So that would be worth picking up for sure. Especially if you had an older DVD release. Yeah. I mean, that's a, you know, those, cl- uh, wow, it's like, you know, for some reason I looked at that and for some reason in my head, I, uh, I thought I was misreading it at 1987, but it really is 1987. I thought it was like 1967, I figured, but no. Okay, that's... No, no, it's actually 87. Okay. Uh, and now we're going to completely switch gears. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So we go from a you know classic Italian horror to Attack of the Killer Tomatoes <laughs> from uh, 1978. Now, I vaguely remember seeing this movie probably on hbo or something or clips of it and it terrifying me hmm. at some level because i've i have not seen this movie since i was a little kid but i remember scenes from it that scared me half to death i don't know why. now obviously today it would yeah be no yeah, now it's a it's 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 laughable the the effects yeah. of it and um i remember though the coolest release of this i saw it was a video release videotape and it it was like some special edition, and it came with a packet of tomato seeds on it to I guess grow your <laughs> plant your own That's tomatoes. And I, was, I was like, that is the coolest thing ever. I bought it. And I don't know where it, what happened to it in the, the grand scheme of things. God knows, in some box in my storage thing, there's a package of tomato seeds. I guess, but <laughs> but I know I have it somewhere. <laughs> this one's by uh, MVD Visual, directed by John DeBello. Starring David Miller, George Wilson, no relation, Sharon Taylor. And I was going to say, look, you, Tim. <laughs> uh, a group of scientists band together to save the world from mutated killer tomatoes. Now, one thing I did want to point out is I had, I don't know why this movie triggered this memory, but I had an Atari 2600 game and it was called Revenge of the Beef Steak Tomato. I totally remember that. And it, it kind of. You remember that? Yes. And it had like a little song just like the movie did with it. Yeah, but it was, I mean, it's not officially licensed part of the movie because but it does say 20th century fox on the on the cartridge like it was a 20th century fox release game but i don't think it's necessarily tied directly to this movie well back then remember how loose rights were it was so yeah, weird yeah. how you could like but like i mean you could literally rip off uh another uh game to the to the to the core of it, as long as you change one little thing about it, like like remember, like Odyssey Two had Casey Munchkin, which was basically Pac Man. Just, I mean, yeah. it was all they had, and it was so, but it was so, so many things were so much, so identical. And remember, that was when you could actually get video game systems from Sears that mimicked Atari and a television, and they play the yeah, game. There was like no license, yeah, rights whatsoever. Was like every, there was all these knockoff, crazy, like underground games. Yeah, come, like and, and remember, ColecoVision came out with a, a device that could convert it, so you could play Atari Twenty Six Hundreds on the ColecoVision, which I had, and that basically was not Atari never licensed it and allowed it. But, but but there was no way. <laughs> but but the, the way the laws were at that time, they couldn't stop it. I mean, I think they made an attempt, but it didn't matter because it was released and it was sold. And and I think in hindsight, they probably realized, well, what's the difference if they're still buying Atari games? They want to play Atari games and play it that way. Yeah. yeah, we may not sell the systems, but we're gonna be. But you know, at that point, the systems were getting phased out to twenty six hundreds anyway, and they were moving to the the seventy eight hundreds. I think. So yeah, that was, so it was a crazy time because it was all new. Yeah, I mean that was a new thing. But yeah, the uh, Revenge of the Beefsteak Tomatoes game, where you had this little syringe, you would float around the syringe and you would uh, suck up these colored bricks, and then you would shoot them down and make a wall because there was these tomato plants that were shooting seeds up at you from the bottom of the screen. Okay. So you were building this wall to like protect yourself from the tomato seeds, and all the while there's also these like 
killer tomatoes that were would run across the screen that you'd have to dodge and stuff. I just remember that game was really fun for some reason. I went back and looked at a YouTube video of it, and I was like, oh my god, this looks terrible. But <laughs> I, I, I spent many an hour on that game. I don't know. Uh, yeah, at the time, you know, you that's, that's when you had one game, you played it. Oh, yeah. For months, yeah. Like Adventure yeah. for Atari and Yars Revenge. Yeah. I mean, you'd literally god, play the Pitfall, same thing over yeah. and over. Oh my god, Pitfall, yeah. Pitfall absolutely was, was I think, the probably the game that I, I spent on Atari the most. When I remember when I got that thing, I just would not... And like, because, you know, and I kept like... I don't think I ever got to the end. You know, all, like I think it was like it was famous no, for having did. 256 different screens. And I remember I would count and count. I think the closest I ever got was through 200 of them and i still remember like at one point going a little off topic i still remember that i would get to the point where you know remember how you usually just be swinging on the rope and you know that little (laughs) but then you'd get to the one where there were just the three alligator heads but no rope and you had to hop on their the, their eyeball Our type eyes. of thing. Yeah. And I remember, like, I the first time I did it, I couldn't figure out how to do it, so I decided to start the game over and go the other way. But I ended up getting to that way much faster. Remember, if you went the other way, everything would be reversed. Like the the holes would open up reversed sometimes. So you yeah. Mm-hmm. So it really was easier if you went a certain way. So yeah. So that yeah, that game was um was was definitely a, an, an event. But it's funny, too, about the Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Um, recently, I don't know if you got it as far as um, North Carolina, but I know in the, somewhat in our area, they have a – there's been a recent outbreak of listeria and romaine lettuce. So apparently just salad kills people, so be careful. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, yeah, stop being healthy. Exactly. Kills. Better ways. Go, get, go eat a burger. <laughs> well, this one has a 4K restoration, an audio commentary, deleted scenes, and six featurettes and a collectible poster. Oh it, my. it might be worth it. Yeah, actually, that uh, I gotta tell you, that's a really great set for that movie. <laughs> for, for that movie, yeah. yeah. Uh, I had a couple of, these are just 4K remasters, so I did not go into the whole synopsis, and that, of course, is Cloverfield and 10 Cloverfield Lane. Those are getting 4K yeah, re-releases. Yeah, well, it's, it's probably to promote, because I think the new one's coming out this summer in the, in the Cloverfield series. Yeah, yeah, they usually do that. I, I've enjoyed those. I, those are not ones that I'm like, completely obsessed like i enjoy them but they're not ones i want to go back and rewatch. Yeah, although the first one i absolutely loved and used to watch it a lot when i first got it again i just something about mm. it and it's funny because it like it it, it, it had tj miller in it like you know and i was before i think really he was was anything big and it's so funny because you just get little like quirks of what he is like you know like before he became like that that tj miller total character that he is now it was like just little bits of a minute it was great <laughs> I, I i actually loved the first one and i was kind of hoping the second one was uh you know had like you know obviously there's a, a loose tie into it i was kind of hoping they do a true sequel to the because yeah, i heard that well because well, i heard there was an original uh idea for the second one uh, for the second one was going to be the first movie just shot from a different perspective of someone else going through the city hmm. and i just i mean i just love monster movies to begin with especially when monsters are giant and huge like that and the fact that they did it in a found footage style and the fact that it was like such a secret release and you didn't know it was like yeah it was that just was cool to market it perfectly and and when the second uh, one was it was great and i love john goodman in it it was probably the best work he's ever done. oh absolutely yeah but it was too intense. I mean, that's that's the thing. That's why I don't want to go watch that movie again. Like, it was too much. It was it was too mentally taxing to go through that movie one time. I was I was kind of done with it. Not that I didn't enjoy yeah. it. I loved it, but it was just too mentally taxing. It's heavy. It's he- it's a heavy movie. Yeah, it's, so heavy. it's not one you can watch. Like the first one, I think you can watch over and over again. Yeah, it's a fun monster. Yeah, movie. The, the second one's more of a psychological one. It's very claustrophobic. And yeah, just, eh. it's harder to rewatch. Uh, yeah, it's definitely harder to rewatch. Yeah. And that's no no means uh, disparaging the movie at all. It's great. I, I think it's a credit to the yeah, movie. That yeah, it's that intense. Yeah. Uh, the next one up, uh, I've heard this one buzzed about, but I haven't don't know much about it. It's the killing of a sacred deer. That's from last year. Uh, re- released by Lionsgate, directed by Yorgos Lanthimos. That's got the co- that's got to be one of the coolest yeah. names in the, in yeah, this cool in name. this uh, dismemberment. <laughs> uh, but starring Nicole Kidman and Alicia Silverstone. I don't know oh, she was yeah. still doing anything. And uh, Barry Keegan, I guess. And uh, the synopsis is: Stephen, a charismatic surgeon, is forced to make an unthinkable sacrifice after his life starts to fall apart. 
when the behavior of a teenage boy he has taken under his wing turns sinister. Hmm. Interesting. So, uh, this only has a like a lot of Lionsgate releases just has a featurette, nothing, <laughs> nothing to to speak of in terms of features. So yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. It'd be worth a worth a rental. Yeah. I guess. Uh, the next one up is Jigsaw, which is also being released in a 4K version. This, of course, is the latest entry in the Saw franchise, which I spoke about. That's a few the one back. we forgot to mention in our when we were talking about the uh, one we had planned for our uh, summer vacation. I think Saw we left. Yeah, there. Saw. Yep, mm, that was that's it. another heavy franchise. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot of films. Uh, released again by Lionsgate, which means you get do get a commentary with this one and a featurette uh, directed by Michael and Peter Spierig. Starring Matt Passmore, Tobin Bell, Callum Keith Rennie. Bodies are turning up around the city, each having met a uniquely gruesome demise. As the investigation proceeds, evidence points to one suspect, John Kramer, the man known as Jigsaw, who has been dead for 10 years. Like I said, this one, I was disappointed in this one. I thought it was just another run-of-the-mill Saw movie. So, um, yeah, I just, I was, you know, I was kind of hoping to that reboot that would just really invigorate the franchise. And it turned out to be just... <laughs> Basically, this could have been released ten years ago and and fit right in with the rest of the series. I mean, it, it, to me, it did not add anything new or interesting to the franchise. So, in what Tim is saying is, I guess Jigsaw didn't cut it. Well, speaking of bad puns, here's one disc title: Dance D A N C E. Macabre. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Which, when I was little, I used to pronounce that macra, macabre. Because I thought it was mac, like macrame. Oh, yeah. So I thought it was macabre. Or but macabre. It's not. You never know. Or macabre, yeah. I don't. I actually don't know how you literally... I think it's macabre, it. right? That's the real way to say it, right? If you want to say it like all I've fancy. heard, I've heard people say macabre, and I've heard people say macabre. Yeah. I guess look for the person that says it with their pinky in the air as they sip yeah. tea. Yeah. We ain't fancy down here in the South, Ryan. I yeah. just say it however I want. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This one's interesting in that it has Robert England, who I found out is coming to Mad Monster Party yes. in Charlotte, which means he is going to be close. I have to. I still haven't made my mind up whether I'm going or not. I know that's a sacrilege, but I got to save some money. Well, yeah, no, and then I'm like torn between. I got to like. There's that great. Uh, a Monster Mania convention with all the Jasons at it, and John Carpenter, and it's. Oh uh, yeah. There's a Too lot. many horror conventions. Yeah. Some really good ones this year. Mm. And John Carpenter's 80. I made a mistake. I think I told you he was 100. He's 80. Oh, okay. But That's still, yeah. that's still up there. Yeah. But it's John Carpenter, so, you know. Yeah, I mean, you got... Yeah. yeah how can you pass that up? Yeah, that'll be um, tough. <laughs> yeah, this one is uh, from 1992. It's a Shout Factory release, directed by Graydon Clark. Let me tell you, the IMDb score for this one was not kind. It was in the under three... Well, uh, based on your your just the, the synopsis here, if Robert England plays the dance instructor, I could see why. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, Robert England, Michelle Zeitlin, May- Mariana Moen, a dance instructor. Uh, instructor. The yeah. beer's getting to me. Uh oh. That's what that mad off will do to you. Because you you uh, didn't get your coffee like you're supposed. To. Yeah, that's right. I was told there would be coffee, <laughs> Olivia. <laughs> She'd probably be like what, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> a dance instructor brings his dance troupe to Russia for training. What his dancers don't know, however, is that he has a dual personality, and his hidden personality is Freddy Krueger. I know. Wouldn't that be great if he did yeah, that? it's actually a serial killer. Just a serial, regular serial killer. You're a little light on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this this one could go on all day. They would just, uh... <laughs> the jokes write themselves. Yeah, for this one. Robert Englund as a, as a dance instructor. Uh, I don't know. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, the the next one up, uh, actually our last one for this week is the Twilight People from 1972. I like this one. I like the I like this one. This is one that I could dig. It yeah. goes into my 70s horror thing. It does and it's uh, by the year of my birth? See, remember you had a lot yeah. from 74. This one's from my mm-hmm. birth year, 72. 72. All right, this was released by VCI, directed by Eddie Romero. <laughs> he was also in Welcome Back. Cotter's yeah, he was. Yeah, it's a Welcome Back Cotter themed week. Apparently, yeah. Disc uh, starring John Ashley, Pat Woodall, Jan Merlin, a kidnapped diver. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> How do you kidnap a diver? Yeah. That's tough. All right. 
a kidnapped diver is taken to an island inhabited by a mad scientist and his half animal, half human creations. Is it? I wonder if this was loosely based on the, like the island of Doctor. I was Moro just gonna say that. I was like, that's what I'm thinking of. Was there any kidnapped divers in that? I don't know. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, maybe that's where the people from uh, Open Water went. Yeah, or the uh, what's the other one? The Mandy Moore one, right? Forty-seven. Yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, this one is remastered, has a commentary, an interview, and a trailer. So I'm going to look that one up. That sounds interesting. I've never heard of that one, Twilight. No, I didn't either, right? Yeah. I got to say, I mean, I guess that's the ones with uh, it's the, the group, right? With the one's a construction worker, one's the Indian chief, one's. The, oh, no, that's the village people. Sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a little off. Okay. <laughs> no, we're not talking oh about Can't Stop the Music by the with the starring the village people and Steve Gutenberg. Okay. Now you've got. <laughs> Have you got me seeing seeing them doing the YWCA, but there's a, or YMCA, but there's a guy at the end in a full scuba outfit. Oh, another Kickstarter! There you go. <laughs> Look at that. We're reinventing the village people live. And he's on trying them. to yeah. do the letters with flippers on, and it's not working. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. We'll have to have like a different thing because uh, you know the the A won't be able to be spelled with it with the scuba gear, so we'll have to change yeah. the, the the whole dynamic. <laughs> Oh, unfortunately, no theatrical releases this week, except for Paddington Two, if you count that as horror. It could be depending actually, on how good it is. I don't, I don't know. know. It got it got it's got the fourth ever one hundred percent rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Really? Wednesday. Yeah, my kids went and saw it. They loved it. Oh, okay. Well, it. I actually enjoyed the first Paddington. It was really good. And now we're way off topic. But yeah, yeah. So for kids' movies, those are great. So. Well, you know, I mean, uh, you know, when you talk about padding, you can't bear not to talk about. It. Yeah! Sorry. <laughs> okay, moving oh. on. All right. <laughs> now let's go into the perfect segue. <laughs> you haven't been fired yet this year, so I know that's true. I needed to, you were to start. Yeah, I was one episode in. I mean, that's that's, that's crazy that oh I, I haven't God. been close yet. Oh, anyway, so <laughs> this week's feature is, of course, Terror Train, which is one of our. Uh, poll selections for a new year's movie because it actually does take place on new year's yes uh this one is from 1980 it was directed by roger spottiswood starring ben johnson jamie lee curtis david copperfield <laughs> and hart buckner it's so funny when i when i was a kid david copperfield and then i heard that there was an actual book called david copperfield i thought it was i thought it was the same one yes the same. i did too I did too, and and it's funny too because one of my the best lines in um in uh the Twilight Zone in my favorite episode of the Twilight Zone, which is the time enough at last, the you know the Burgess Meredith one. Oh yeah, I love that when he's you know he's trying to get to his uh, telling everybody because he's reading that book and he's like, "Have you ever read David Copperfield?" And he does that whole thing, and he's like, and he goes to, you know, oh, it's a wonderful book, and there's the evil villain named Murdstone. Isn't that a villain's name? Murdstone. So, yeah, so I cannot let, as soon as I, I, was, I saw David Copperfield appear, flooding back to that episode, which it was oh so gosh. loosely related in no way whatsoever. Okay, so, <laughs> but sorry, so there's my little Burgess Meredith impersonation. Well, we, we were so low on impersonations this year. Really? We got we got to really? step up yeah. the pace. Oh, well, we did have Burgess uh, Meredith, or the Rocky Burgess Meredith. Remember, he appeared on season one. Oh, that's right. Oh <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, Burgess okay. Meredith, because it was in uh, the Manitou. So episode, what was that two? That's right. Wow, oh yeah, yeah, episode two. Look at wow. that, way back. Uh, episode two, he appears again. Look at that. I'm still terrified to go listen to those early episodes. I'm utterly terrified. Yeah. Manitou, I won't do it. though, not. That one will be good. That one was great. But That one was good. But think of that. Burgess Meredith appears in only episode two of every season, so he can never come back again until the end, <laughs> until next se- season three, right. episode two. He's off limits. Yeah. Okay, so the synopsis for this one is a masked killer targets six college kids responsible for a prank gone wrong three years earlier and who are currently throwing a large New Year's Eve costume party aboard a moving train. Finally, Olivia has brought me my coffee. Hey, hello, Dearest. Olivia. Dearest. Dearest. Oh, my lo- Oh my gracious. Did you tell her that she made an appearance uh, on the yeah. show by not bringing the coffee at first? She finally brought me. I was told there would be coffee. <laughs> I was told there would be coffee. It's cold in here, darling. <laughs> I can hear it. I'm going to be divorced. I can this. hear the look Olivia just gave you. <laughs> oh, yeah. She just, she, she just gave me the look. Anyway. <laughs> So, um, yeah, Terror Train. So I watched the the extra features for this one, which are really interesting because uh, Roger Spottiswood goes into 
the basically the creation of this movie and i'm not going to give too much away about it because it's, it plays into our trivia question oh yeah you can not yeah but his <laughs> idea for this movie to the start of principal filming was only four months so basically he he came up with this idea he fast-tracked it they had a script pounded out they had everything in place and they were recording within four months so he says one of the quickest movies he's ever done yeah, it looked like yeah, based on that, yeah, and I read that actually in the in just some research it even said that. So it's it's like a pretty well known fact that this movie went and, and, and you know, if you think about it too, it was it, it Jamie Lee Curtis pretty much at that point, basically within two year time, had been in four horror movies. So basically she was like full on screen queen by the time this came out. And this was a lot of people think that this was like you know, this was early on in terms of that. And it was technically I think her fourth fourth film, right? Because I think she did right, the, cause, the fog before this, uh, prom night and Halloween. Yeah, and I, I remember um, in the features he was talking about how lucky they thought they were to get Jamie Lee Curtis because she he, she was a big star at this point. Yeah, a horror star at least. You know, she was she was definitely an up and comer. So they were thrilled to get her in in this movie. But this is an this is just an interesting movie. So it starts off, and I'm not going to go scene by scene. I'll we'll just kind of give you an overview. But it starts off with. Uh, a prank gone wrong. So you basically, uh, this a medical school. These medical students decide to trick kind of the uh, the typical virgin nerd guy into uh, basically making him believe he's he's going to have sex with this girl, Jamie Lee Curtis, no less. Jamie Lee Curtis, no less. Yeah, that, that's a which, good point. Which at that and, time, who wouldn't fall for that, right? And go, you know, yeah, you know. really. But they uh, instead they trick him and put a basically a dead corpse in the bed. So you know he kind of. Uh, comes in and, and discovers this dead corpse instead of Jamie Lee Curtis. And for some reason, <laughs> turns him into spiling around like he's in a, in like some kind of. That was a weird scene. Doing a yeah, ribbon he, dance. He got, what is that? Why he gets, was he spinning? He gets caught in like oh, there's like some kind of like mosquito drapery yeah, net, netting over the bed that he gets caught in. But so basically, the the point of the intro is to kind of give you set up the uh, potential reason for the killer's murderous rampage. Right. You have this guy that was just uh destroyed by this this terrible prank which jamie lee curtis feels terrible about by the way right she's not she's not sadistic or... yeah like she feels you could tell she feels um I- instantly bad like during it almost that she's yeah she didn't even want to do yeah, it she didn't want to do it and she didn't think it was going to be anything i don't think she realized the the extent of what they were going to do so anyway uh three years later everybody's graduating and so they decide to take which to me sounds like one of the coolest New Year's ideas ever. Uh, they decide to take this train, a costume party on a train right. for New Year's. How cool does that sound? No, it's all, uh, it looks awesome. And I, I mean, I will will say though, I don't know where all these college students got this kind of loot to, to to rent an entire train out like this, complete with one of the number one musicians in the world on it, yeah, <laughs> David well, Copperfield. Also, was unclear is like where does the train go to? Like, what do you do when you get off the train? Like. Do you have to like hitchhike? Well, they, yeah, back? I know. Or do you take another train back the next day? Well, or? I mean, they were, call- that work? they were calling it an excursion train, so usually I I am assumed it was going to make a circuitous route. Okay, that's what okay. I assumed. like, kind of like a party boat. Yeah, that's how I took it. I could be completely wrong. I it could be one of those things where they're like, well, that's not the plot of the movie, so stop asking. <laughs> You know, it could be just one of those things. I mean, of course, though, that's where mine went too. Um, you know, I do think of that. I'm like, okay, so what are they just renting this train to go in a? It's circle? like one of those um trains that goes around the Christmas tree, just goes in a big circle. Yeah, like if you, I don't know if you've heard of Strasburg Railroad in Pennsylvania, but you can take a trip and it's a long, like big, like I think it's a couple of hours, and you can have lunch on the train. It's basically like a two hour loop it takes you. So. Yeah. Well, this thing was cool because the uh, the train used in the movies was an actual steam train. Which, yeah, you can visit it, actually. They said one of the cars is still on display, I think, in Arizona, I read. So you can actually get on board. You can, I think, actually tour the exact train car. Well, oh, I don't cool. know if they'd say, like, this is the one used in Terror Train. Because I think the actual train car itself was some sort of historical uh, train to begin with. Yeah, in fact, um, in the features, the director was talking about how they had to get, like, this 80-year-old conductor who originally drove that train to come in and get the train moved to the set because they didn't have people who knew how to run this thing. That's funny. Yeah. It, 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 and it, but I'll tell you, it pays off because you, at no time do you feel like you're like, they just took a train, they built a train car set or they just like, and it's really, it's basically most of the time it's literally in a giant uh, warehouse and they're just rocking a train, but you don't get that feel because of the authenticity of the, the train car. 
Right, yeah, they they filmed this completely on an actual train. So they said, you know, when they were doing shots and reverse shots, they basically had to, to take shots from one angle, completely break down everything, hope that the continuity matched up, and shoot the shots from the reverse angle because they didn't have enough room to move the cameras around. Yeah, and I heard they actually built, like, the, the like for dolly shots, they had to build, like, thinner track. Like, they actually had to do a lot of... Uh... And it, it actually put them behind a few days. Um, I saw it too, and there was actually the, the point of where the, the producers were. There was a dispute between the producer and the director where they said where they were they were I guess five days behind in shooting on this because of all these these pitfalls I guess they had. So the the, the guy said just take four four pages out of the script, <laughs> and the director did not was having none of that. So I guess apparently I guess which is must have been expensive at the time. They said he finally relented the producer and they they shelled out a check for twenty five thousand. They said to complete the rest of the movie in terms of you know to cover the overages of time yeah but you can really tell i mean the it it really looks fantastic it looks authentic uh you you people are crowded into these rooms and it really does feel claustrophobic which is like a perfect setting for a a horror movie i mean think about it you get you get a magic stage basically on this train you got a band playing on this thing it's it's, this is yeah it's crazy full bar (laughs) you know like the bar car is like really like packed with a bar on it and stuff, yeah. Now, I know we kind of play fast and loose with spoilers on Civil Gore, depending on the movie. Um, we, we try to stay away from spoilers in newer movies, but we kind of, you know, if they're, if they're beyond a certain age, we, we right. don't really care. This one, this one I don't really want to spoil, because if you haven't seen this one, it actually is really, it actually does have a really good twist to it. Right, um, right. So, I, I'm not going to spoil it. Uh, suffice it to say that... Um, the killer makes it onto the train, as you would expect. Right. Uh, I don't think that's a spoiler to tell <laughs> no, you that. Yeah, I think but you figure that one what's out. interesting is that because this is a costume party, you don't know who's who. You don't know who's behind these masks. So you do have a few suspects. Of course, you got the guy in the Groucho mask. Right. Which uh, you called the... Uh, um, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the Jean Shallot. Yeah. <laughs> the Jean Shallot mask. <laughs> it's actually a Groucho yeah. mask. Uh, you have a guy in a lizard costume, full lizard costume. Uh, who else did you have? You had a guy's a bird. You had a witch, and the the, um, the old man or something, right? Or was that the witch? I, old man. I can't remember. That might have been the witch. Oh yeah, yeah that you had been. like one was a monk, I think. And during this all, what was was really crazy is during this whole uh, movie, there's a magician performing on the train. David Copperfield, actually <laughs> David Copperfield, yes. the real David Copperfield. I mean, he's yep. young as he can be, and um, I I just remember that uh. Now the director said the only reason David Copperfield was in this movie is because he liked magic. Yeah, he, he there was this, there was no original magician in the script or part of the script. <laughs> he just threw him in there yeah. because he likes magic and he wanted to see some magic tricks. Yeah, and he so, did those real tricks. He said, I, "I saw a thing." David Copperfield said he said he had to be very careful with his tricks because the film shows so much that he literally had to like almost tweak his tricks slightly. To, um, because he said basically what you see on film is what all the extras and everybody saw. So he basically did perform these magic tricks in front of everybody live like that for the show and had to be extra careful because he didn't want the film to inadvertently pick up something that would spoil the trick. Yeah, that's amazing. I've always been a huge David Copperfield fan. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We, we grew up with him, though. That was like, that was like our David Blaine at the time. You know, there was, you mm-hmm. know, that was, he would have full on specials on TV and he'd yeah. always be on those, uh, you know, the, the, whatever, the prime time, like ensemble shows, he'd have an appearance and do a trick. And... Yeah, I remember um, it was him and Doug Henning. Was oh, Doug one. Henning. That's right. Yeah. It was a great one. Um, Remember Martin Short doing John Henning, uh, Doug Henning? Yeah. That was classic. <laughs> that was hilarious. Yeah. Uh, Doug Henning was such a character, though. Yeah. Oh, my God, with his teeth and everything. But anyway, uh, yeah, the reason I loved magic so much was because uh, my granddad would literally take me to every magic show that came to town. It oh, did, nice. did not matter what magic show came. And that for some reason, I remember there was a lot of them back when I was growing up. I don't think you see that kind of thing these days. But no, and you know, it's funny you said that because I there used to be uh, we used to go to this restaurant. There's a Beefsteak Charlie's. Um, I don't know if dude they had those in Carolina, but it was like it was like a chain steakhouse here. They were famous for their all you can eat shrimp. And actually, an episode of the Goldbergs just featured it on it, and it brought all this nostalgia back. And the one we used to go to actually had a magician on certain nights come through and and do tricks while you dined like you'd come to your table and hmm. do tricks and everything and and I think my mom actually 
I think she hired him from one of my birthday parties as a kid. It was, it was Michael the Magician. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And it's funny. We know another Michael the Magician, our good friend Michael Collins, yeah. <laughs> who is an excellent yeah. magician, actually. And uh, Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so it's funny you said that. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, all kind of nerdy people got into magic at some point right, or another right. in their lives. That's a movie we have to do, by the way. Magic. with. Uh, oh, my God. Yeah, that's a cool Yeah, one. with Anthony Ho- uh, Hopkins. Yeah, that would be great. We need to do that one with a double feature with Dead Silence. Yes, yes. Two uh, evil ventriloquist uh, movies. That would be great. Um, no, but I, yeah, I'll just, I was always into magic growing up. I got uh, largely through my granddad. I remember he took me to, like, he would take me to magic shops and buy me, like, these really nice, expensive magic books, which I still have, that are, like, really high caliber. You know, not, not the stuff you would buy off the shelf. I mean, these are, like, actual have to go to a magic shop to buy them kind of books. And then uh, I remember one one time, I think one of the last magic shows I went to with him, uh, Houdini, Houdini's niece was there. Oh, wow. And she was, gosh, an elderly woman even at that time when I was a child. And I have still have an autographed copy of her. And the photo is of her when she was three years old sitting on Houdini's knee oh that's and, awesome uh, and, and she signed the the uh, and personalized the picture so that's really cool i'll just send a i'll have to take a picture of it and maybe put it on instagram or something it's really neat. oh that's cool yeah i know i i kind of i've always liked houdini too i actually read a book on uh recently actually i think over the summer i read it was a little short book because they featured there was houdini featured on an episode of that show timeless yep mm-hmm. and i also got that uh houdini movie uh i ordered uh with adrian brody um, and I love the attraction at uh, the Six Flags uh, parks that they have. Uh, some of them it's called Houdini's Great Escape. Just like a little one. It's like the whole ride is kind of one of those like little trick illusion type of things where it makes it feel like the, the room turns upside down. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I, lo- I used to do reports on Houdini all the time in school. I'm sure the teachers got tired of it because that's all I would do is Houdini book reports. But Oh, and speaking of Adrian Brody, which is, again, completely off topic. I'm sorry, we're rambling. <laughs> he is phenomenal in season four of Peaky Blinders, if you haven't seen that. Oh, no, I haven't seen that show. Oh, my, oh my God, that show is so awesome. I got to watch that. Adrian, yeah, Adrian Brody uh, plays an American mafioso in, in season four, and it's incredible. Nice. So good, so, so, so good. All right, um, anyway, so back to the uh, the magic. Of course, David Copperfield fe- features quite prominently in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, he's kind of just always there, hanging around doing magic tricks. But, um, uh, yeah, so at, at any rate... um. To move the plot along, you you have a series of murders, of course, take take place on this train. Um, the conductor, uh, I'm trying to remember his name. That was a uh, oh gosh, that was a uh, Ben Johnson. I liked him actually, his character a lot. Yeah, he was fantastic in this. You know, he's kind of you know he's kind of bemused at the whole idea of these college students on this train partying, but at the same time, you know, when things when stuff starts happening, he realizes that he's the only one that's gonna. Uh, be able to do anything about this yeah you know, this is they're on a train they don't have access to uh, i think that they, they made some excuse for the well, radio doesn't work yeah there's a big foreshadowing early yeah i told these guys to have a radio on this train what if someone falls off <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly in fact that cracks me up what when, when uh when uh jamie the curtis i mean this is a minor spoiler i guess you know there's going to be a body count at some point and i guess her friend her best friend is killed and she and the and the, the uh, conductor's trying to break it to her easily. And she goes, oh, my God, did she fall off the train? I'm like, how <laughs> often does this happen that this is now mentioned no, no. twice in this movie already? <laughs> you know, it's like yeah, you really. usually don't hear people falling off train. Cruise ships, I don't know. Yes, these, these, but... these kids were pretty drunk. That's true. <laughs> I can kind of see it happening, especially if he's used to these party excursions. Yeah, but just the way she says it, she's like, oh, my God, yeah. did she fall off the train? And I'm like, I, I, I couldn't help but laugh, actually, just the way she said it. So, But, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. You know, I mean – for for a movie to be this enclosed and this claustrophobic, it's actually very entertaining because you know they keep it moving because you know they're jumping from car to car and from people to people and couple to couple, so that it never feels like you're just stuck in this one train at you, per se. No, it but it actually feels like you're. I, I mean, I mean, it doesn't sound weird, but but it kind of feels like you're a part of it. Like you know whether it was intentional to to make you get that. That feeling that you – because it feels like as you're going through the train, it feels like you're like literally at the party with them kind of. You know, it's just because it's like there's so yeah. much going on and and there's a lot of scenes that just are almost like – that you would almost have 
I, what I would like to – what you'd figure you just only kind of see in the background, but they kind of make it a scene to just kind of feel, always make you feel like that you're part of that party going on. Well, I think it's – I think it was a limitation of the camera because it had to always be close up. You know, they always say close-up shots build intimacy true, between true. the viewer viewer and the actors. I mean, at this point, you didn't have, the, didn't have a choice. Right. There were no far-out shots, so you were always up close with all the actors. So, yeah, I can definitely see how that would make you feel like you're part of the action. The uh, the thing I alluded to last episode though was uh, when you finally do get some uh, to the third act where the you know the killer's maybe not revealed but the killer is is basically stalking the final girl which in this case is Jamie Lee Curtis of course which I mentioned last episode man that that there's a really protracted fight between those two which is really really good I oh thought it was, yeah yeah I thought it was an amazing showdown between the killer and the final girl that for this time you know, again this is 1980 you're still early this is before a lot of the the bigger uh franchises have really took off to have such a great showdown uh between the last two in you know, the final girl and the villain was pretty pretty cool to me yeah no it's uh, yeah and especially when uh you know, it's like like we've said you, you know she's trapped on the train and it's not like she has a lot of space to go you know, and she basically corners herself, but still fight. You know, fight, has to fight her way out, and and it's you know, it's just it's very. It, it actually does build a lot of really good tension in there because you know you're like, all right, how is the hell is she going to get out of this? You know, it's like, well, I think again, I think that's where the uh, confines of the train worked in favor of the movie right. because you can't just have her run out of a door and across the lawn and across to the neighbor's house like you could in Halloween. You've got her trapped in a room. You can't. There's no way to get her out of it. Yeah, you have to figure out some way for her to fight back and to me that made it a lot more effective than what you see in a lot of other movies these days where you know where basically the final girl is just one protracted chase scene right which is not the case here no this was not i mean yes okay and you could say it's a bit of a chase because he's going after her but it's not basically not a chase in 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 the traditional sense i mean because you really don't extend past i think one train car possibly the second one and it all takes place in a really small area, but yet it doesn't feel like it. It, it definitely makes it, it doesn't make it dull. And like you said, I think it works in its favor because it's like it's really intense, close up in your face uh, sequence. Yeah. So I won't give any more away because that would be given that'd be going too far into spoiler country. So I'll, I'll just let you enjoy the the ending for yourself. Yes. But um, it has a has a you know a nice little twist, and to me. This movie is underrated. I, th- I, f- I feel like it's underrated. And the only reason I say that is I know people consider it a classic. Obviously, it got a Scream Factory release. It's not unknown or anything. Right. And, and, of course, starring Jamie Lee Curtis, of course, it's it's known. But I, in terms of just, you know, when I was growing up and going through horror and stuff, I'd never heard of this movie. I may, Maybe I'd men- had heard it mentioned, but I had not mentioned it in the same vein as like your Halloweens and your Friday the 13th and your other great 80s slashers. No, it was definitely it was definitely below those in terms of notoriety, but definitely not in quality because I think it, it, it holds its own right up there. And, and you know, I'd put it right up there with them if, if I was going to put in terms of that, that time period. I mean, that's a, it's, 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 it's just one of those movies that, it's almost like if you don't, if you haven't seen it yet, you need to watch it, or you're kind of doing yourself a disservice <laughs> if you don't see it. Yeah, I, it's one of those. Now, the way I'm, I'm trying to describe it is, if I went up to a person and said, "Hey, have you seen Terror Train?" I'm guessing they probably haven't. Probably. Whereas not. if I go to a person and say, "Have you ever seen Halloween?" They right. probably have. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying it's as good as Halloween by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not putting it up at that same level, but I'm saying just from name recognition alone. It's it's not one of those that you typically hear people mention in the same breath with all the great '80s horror movies, which I, it's kind of a shame because I think it's really really good. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's better than Prom Night, and that's always up there and far better. I, yeah, I liked it. This one far better than Prom yeah. Night. Yeah, and I mean, it's funny, you know, who I who I did, did forgot was com- was in there was Vanity. She went by a different name in the credits, but yeah, <laughs> I forgot. I was like, who is that? I'm like, that looks familiar. She looks so familiar. And then when I looked it up, I'm like, oh my god, that's vanity. That's right. Yeah, you know, it's like, so you know, it's funny yeah. that it has like it had so, like and and it's funny she it doesn't look like the, any different than she does. It looks like she's the same age throughout her whole life. Oh yeah, she, yeah, she's one of those ageless people. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, terrific, terrific movie. Definitely pick up the Scream Factory edition. It doesn't have a lot of extras. 
but I will say the featurettes on it are entertaining and good. No, and uh, the print for, is for good. Little... And the print, the quality the print is, is great. great. Yeah, it looks great. Uh, it's a great movie to own. I can see myself re- rewatching this one over and over. Oh yeah, it might go into my holiday rotation. You know, like you know, we have the, the certain ones for Christmas, Halloween. I think this might go into my New Year's, along with. Oh yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah. What else, really? I mean, you're gonna put it with. You're not putting it with New Year's Evil. <laughs> no, nah, New Year's Evil's kind of dead to me. So yeah, this one would definitely go in my New Year's list. I know uh, Amanda always watches Jaws on New Year's, or that was on our Jaws episode. But right, um, well, that one doesn't really have anything to do with New Year's. That's just a that's just an annual thing. This one might be my annual. Yeah, I think we might may have to make this a a a, a new new yearly uh, tradition. So you had a great beer pairing. I, I I did some preliminary beer pairing work uh, beforehand, but I think yours was way better than what I had come up with. Yeah, I, I was kind of looking. There was actually another one from this brewery, but I went with this one because I thought this was definitely more of a, you know, d- definitely a, a better name. The other one I think was uh, off uh, something rail something, but this one is called Derailed, and it was by the Erie Brewing Company. It's a black cherry cream ale, but I just like the title Derailed because obviously, you know, terror train you know obviously the train did not go off the track as far as we know <laughs> but uh you know definitely definitely their plans were derailed just as an aside the i forgot to mention this earlier the original name for the movie was terrible yes train, it was cause, which is which is awful <laughs> yeah thank god because i think that might have seriously like killed the movie <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so yeah, thank thank goodness they they changed it to Terror Train. Yeah, so yeah, and so uh, I actually want to look this beer up. A black cherry cream ale that sounds good. That's yeah, that sounds really good. And and Erie Brewing Company. Yes, that's a, Erie, that's a little, Erie. Nice little pun there. Yep, Erie. Pun. So and that's actually not that you know I it might be able to get because Erie, Pennsylvania is not that far away. So so the uh, trivia question for last week was a toughie. That was one Brian had. Brian's evil mind to come up with. Yeah, that was... it's about time I gave you guys a tough one. We were back yeah. after a while, so you know. <laughs> uh, two actors in the film New Year's Evil, Roz Kelly and Terry Copley, have something in common. What was it? And no, it was not that they were in New Year's Evil. <laughs> no, no, no. The answer was they both guest starred on Fantasy Island. <laughs> Sorry, guys. The plane, the plane. Uh, I used to love plane, Fantasy Island. Yeah. Oh God, yeah, who didn't love, love that Fantasy one? Island. Yeah, that was a great show. Yeah, showing our age. Plus, it had Ricardo stuff. Montalban. Come on. Yeah, come on. He's awesome. He was con. I know. You know. Con. I mean, you get like anything he says is funny. You know. So you got to. Yeah. Yeah. He was so suave. Oh my god. Who didn't want to go to Fantasy Island? Right. That place was awesome. You know, that's a show that like, like I, I could like it had. I would love to have it. Like they actually, it's funny though. There was kind of a, almost one of the Black Mirror episodes. Kind of reminded me of of fantasy island a bit i'll let you see it and you can decide which one for yourself if you haven't seen it yet but it's it's in season four and i'll let you uh i'll let you get to that one and you tell me you'll you'll know right away i think once you watch it but and because i was gonna say that would be an interesting reboot nowadays i mean i guess you can kind of like westworldish has a twist to it a little bit yeah but um, i'm like i see that I would, I would love like a, a true like fantasy island reboot, but definitely a darker version of it because it was so campy that one, obviously. Yeah. But a cool a darker dark one. fantasy island. Yeah, you know. Another um sounds like a Kickstarter. Idea. I know. I think we got one. Might be might be like horror island. Yeah, or... something like that. Yeah. Uh, so the trivia question for this week. This was kind of a softball. It we is. Gave you, we gave you a hard one last week. We're going to be easy one this week. This one you could you could almost guess this one. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Even without knowing. What two movies combined were said to inspire the plot to Terror Train? Yeah, pretty, pretty, so, pretty simple. If you could take think take of a it. wild guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you know. This is one of those weeks we have no idea what we're doing next. Yeah, we haven't. No uh, yeah, we haven't discussed it. We'll have to. Uh, we'll have to get to because because you know it's January, so it's not really. We don't have a theme for this month per no, se. No, we have a pretty good lineup for uh, February, I believe. Yeah, February got some good ones because we hit our, I think by March we hit our 50th episode. We got a good one for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll have to, uh, Tim and I have to have a, 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 an executive meeting between yeah. <laughs> now and next week and we'll think of so a good one. that's good for you guys because you get a surprise. Right. A surprise for next week. So uh, as usual, um, check us out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Leave us a review on iTunes if you're so inclined. Give us some feedback. Uh, we'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, you can get in touch with us on Gmail, Podcast at gmail.com, or, of course, all the social platforms that I just mentioned. Oh, and you know what? One day you said that. I want to give a shout-out. We, we long overdue shout-out to uh, uh, that guy, Donna Nelly, 
who um, every week he does this great posting of he summarizes all the week's horror podcasts and gives like a little bit of uh, basically gives a, a shout out to every podcast the horror that he that he knows about I guess and tells what they're gonna do and he always mentions us which is great uh, so th- yeah I hope he listens because thank you so much because and, and I, I you know I sent him a message to thank him. Because it's such a great job to do because – especially with so many podcasts out there, you know, it's almost impossible to listen to everyone you want, um, at least in a timely manner. So if you know you have limited time and you want to kind of like get at least the, the, you know, the best of what you can get, he does a great recap so you can see what each uh, topic is for the, the, yeah. the week's podcast. Yeah, yeah, and just get, gives free publicity. Yeah, I mean, for, it's... You know, for for no no questions asked, which I, uh, it was just awesome of him. So I re, yeah, well, I really appreciate those recaps, and I found some good stuff through there. Right, through yeah, these links too. So yeah, that that that's greatly appreciated. That's really cool. All right, guys, so uh, we're gonna wrap up forty second episode here, and we'll see you back next week. Check your tickets because your ticket may be for the terror train. Woo woo. <laughs> Thank you.